Good afternoon. Welcome to Inside the Birds TV. Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan, and it's presented by DraftKings. With the Eagles at 0-2 and, and morale down across the city, we wanted to hear from a voice who could help us get a feel for what life is like inside the building, which sometimes can be a lot different than what's going on outside the building. So with that, we welcome longtime Eagles insider from PhiladelphiaEagles.com, He's the Zen master, Dave Spadaro. <laughs> Dave, really uh, thankful that you could come on. And, uh, in My Bird pleasure. Day. My pleasure. I, I know that I'm here for the morale boost. What, what, <laughs> whether that means anything at all for Sunday against the Bengals, I have no idea. Um, but I'm willing to do my part to get, to get everybody back into the good spirits, even though the team is 0-2. All right. Well, I think people need that right now. It's, uh, it's great to have you. And look, PhiladelphiaEagles.com is, is one of the best team official websites. You, the work you do, the work Fran Duffy – C Mac, Chris McPherson, and the whole gang. We really uh, think you guys do an awesome job. So we appreciate Thank you. you coming Thank you. on. And of course, uh, we got to tell our listeners the, to download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code ITB for a special offer when you sign up. That's code ITB for a special offer when you sign up at DraftKings Sportsbook. So, Dave, I alluded to this. You know, having done this for such a long time, that the voices outside the building, the public outcry, the sports talk, what, what we all do, it's, it's, it can be like the sky is falling, but that's not always what it's like inside the building. So just from your own experience, how do you think the demeanor has been lately at the NovaCare? Certainly um, understand how people feel because everybody is disappointed that the Eagles are 0-2. A, a, an unforgivable loss in week one to Washington and then totally outclassed in week two against the Rams. I mean, I don't think there's any other way to look at it. But, you know, internally, there's always you kind of wash away the win or the loss 24 hours after the game's over and you look ahead to the next challenge. And I will say this, you know, to work in the NFL in any capacity, whether you're a player, coach, staff member, whatever, trainer, you have to be great and you have to bring energy every day. And you don't really let yourself get too high after wins and you certainly don't let yourself get blown away by losses. And I think that's where we are right now. Understanding that the urgency level has been high this week because the Eagles have a lot of really tough obstacles here. Game against the Bengals won't be easy, very talented team, and then a brutal three-game stretch, two on the road at San Fran and Pittsburgh, and then home against Baltimore. So mm. there is a sense of reality. This team has very, very little margin for error, and I think one of the fortunate things going forward is that the NFC East is not very strong. But otherwise, a team with a lot of injuries, a team that's performed poorly, a team with a quarterback who's taking the kind of hits – uh, from the media and the fans that he's never taken. I'm really interested to see how they come out on Sunday. Dave, when you look at Doug Peterson and you, you've talked about, you know, you can't worry about what's outside the building. What, how has he been able to, over the years, particularly starting with 17 when Carson Wentz got hurt in December, when everyone thought outside the building they were done, how does he keep things together? Because that was the thing that I would hear from people is that somehow Doug kept a positive attitude when seemingly – Everything else is wrong when you lose your quarterback. So 2017, December, Carson goes down. Eagles clinch the NFC East. We fly back from L.A. We get in at whatever it was, 4 o'clock in the morning. And several hours later, that still same that Monday, Doug and I did our weekly one-on-one -on -one interview, and we talked before uh, we went on the air. And he said, Dave, if anybody in this building does not believe in Nick Foles, then I don't want them to be Philadelphia Eagles anymore. And so I looked at him and I thought, wow, this is hmm. – great optimism. This is kind of the way Doug is. He's this relentless optimist. Um, and he's got to have that right now because he's got a quarterback who is, as I just said, taking some verbal jousts that he's never taken, being called the worst quarterback in the league through two, through two games. I saw uh, Mike Greenberg on ESPN just tear him apart. And I was shocked. And, but you know what? The, the fact is Carson's throwing four interceptions and he's struggling. And so I think internally behind closed doors, it's a bit of a different picture. Doug is hard on his players. Uh, he's also fair with his players. He played the position. He played in the league for 12 years. So he understands that part of it. But to the public, he's always going to be optimistic. Although I will say this, I've noticed this year, and you guys tell me if you agree, Doug has been pointing out very specifically, hey, you know, that guy should have caught that pass. That was a bad decision on that person's part. Uh, this player missed that pickup block on the blitz. So – Maybe more than ever, Doug's kind of called out some players here, and I think that raises the alarms internally. In his own way, 
Yeah, in his own way. But I do believe this. And understanding what everybody thinks, the Eagles have to win on Sunday or this season threatens to be in terrible shape one month into the year. Yeah, you bring up a good point that I was actually going to ask you about, Dave. And I know I think it was Bill Parcells. I could be wrong about this, but some famous good coach who once said, you know, after a while, no matter how good you are as a coach, you can start to lose your voice. So I think it's interesting that what we're hearing from Doug is a little bit different than what we've heard from him in the past. Is this his way of kind of adjusting his voice so that even when it was good, it doesn't become just repetitive and stale? I think so. And I think it's really important. What I find, Jeff, really interesting about this season is that we all thought that because the Eagles had a returning coaching staff and largely returning veterans, that they would be in an advantageous position, certainly in the NFC East with three new coaching staffs. Has not been the case. So you want to make sure that you're not complacent, that you're not going through the motions in practice, that you're not expecting to just show up on Sundays and win football games. And as I think back to the Washington game, I mean, Eagles are up 17 nothing. Who in the world would have thought the game would have ended the way it ended? So I think Doug is kind of making sure that guys understand that there has to be an alarm set here. There has to be some urgency. Uh, if you're not performing, you're going to lose your job. The challenge on that message is that there have been so many injuries uh, that there really, <laughs> there really aren't many other options in many positions here. So I, I just – the whole dynamic here is a bit unique. Eagles haven't started 0-3 since – Andy Reid's first season. Doug has had a great track record here of rallying the troops in the couple of seasons since the Super Bowl and certainly the season of the Super Bowl. So, um, you know, we'll see what kind of energy the Eagles play with. I, I feel like they didn't respond to the empty stadium on Sunday at Lincoln Financial Field. I talked to a lot of players about that. Now they know what to expect. They're home, but that doesn't mean that there's a home field advantage in any way. Dave, I want to pick up on what you were just talking about. And, and, and in an empty stadium, I was there for the scrimmage. That was strange enough. But to go to the game, the team, see them in that stadium, and with nobody in there, what was that situation like for you? It was, um, it was eerie. It was sad. From the walk from the Novacare complex over, and police presence, making sure nobody was tailgating, um, silence on the streets, empty parking lots in the stadium, so they're playing. I actually walked up to the control room to get a sense of how the internal audio works. And it's a separate audio room and it's a single track that an audio engineer just raises and lowers and raises and lowers. It's, it's sound from the 2017 NFC Championship game against Minnesota. Mm. So I think it would be loud, but it's a low murmur. And toward the end of the game, I went out and sat in the stands in the south end zone. And all I could hear was the Rams and the sideline, the noise they were making on the sidelines. The noise, the level, the decibel level of, of the crowd noise is so – it's imperceptible. You see, there's, no, there's no reason to play this. So this is an NFL standard. There is absolutely no variance to it. There's no cheering when the Eagles make a good play. There certainly is no booing, which I know the television audience heard. And that comes from the Fox broadcast, not from the stadium. Uh, but it's a, if, you know, honestly, um, Adam, it's a, it's a hollow, empty, mm. sad, mm. uh, scrimmage-like feeling. It's a, mm. it's a good practice. That's what it feels like. Mm. Oh, certainly a sign of the times. And by the way, I was late to the show on that. I did not realize until earlier this week that it was Fox piping in the booze. I thought it was some kind of uh, really interesting creation on the Eagles' part to have the yeah. The Eagles are not the, <laughs> Jeff, Eagles, <laughs> Eagles, are the, Eagles are not pumping in booze. Ever. I can, I can guarantee you that. Thank well, you, you for gotta, bringing it up, You got to go with what you know, right? And when the uh -huh. Eagles aren't playing well, I, I thought maybe it was like reverse psychology. Like this. <laughs> this, this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let the other people generate the booze. I think the Eagles felt the booze yeah. from the fans watching on their televisions. <laughs> Valley. Yeah, you know, one of the things about feeling the booze and also feeling the bruise, I mean, they've lost so many guys, which they've become accustomed to. I, I feel bad for the Eagle fan because you've got a lot of you, – you've got last year's first-round pick in Andre Dillard. You have this year's first-round pick in Jalen Rager now who's going to be out. Uh, you had Javon Hargrave for a little bit not being able to play, the prize uh, free agent signing. It's almost uh, – sometimes I feel the team is snake bit, but we're also not really seeing the Eagles as who they thought they were going to be two or three months ago. I know every team is dealing with that. Yeah. But um, this team has dealt with it so much over the years. You, know? you can't use it as excuses, though. You know, it oh, started sure. with Brandon Brooks going down with the Achilles tendon in the spring. All of a sudden, you lose a three-time Pro Bowl right guard. 
but your your roster is supposed to be equipped to handle significant injury losses. And the Eagles are going to find out here if J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, who has to produce. I mean, there's just no, it's like now or never for J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. He's going to get playing time. Uh, John Hightower, the rookie, will get playing time with Jalen Rager sidelined. They'll find out if Nate Herbig can be a quality left guard, if Matt Pryor can be a quality right guard. The defense, we don't know if Fletcher Cox is going to play on Sunday. He's battling the abdominal injury. Uh, so, but as you say, Jeff, every team is having, is having experiences. I mean, the Niners lost three key players on Sunday last week. The, the Giants lost their superstar running back. I mean, the Cowboys scored 40 points last week with both of their starting offensive tackles out. So injuries are unfortunate. Injuries certainly don't allow you to uh, show up on Sunday with your best, but they are no excuse in the NFL. And certainly not this year when everybody knew that this was the case and that a short training camp and no OTAs, no spring drills would result in some really serious physical tolls. Dave, you've been around Deshaun Jackson a long time, and I, it's been kind of weird lately. He has not been the deep threat that we thought we would get. I, we know he's healthy, but Deshaun's back here. You, we've mentioned these injuries. Could this be the start this week? Could this actually be the week where they start getting him going downfield? If the offensive line can protect, and I think they will against a Bengals defensive line that comes in shorthanded at the defensive tackle position with, I wouldn't expect Geno Atkins and, and Mike Daniels to play. We'll see about that. Um, certainly that would be their first action. wouldn't be at their best. Uh, Eagles need to do something to score points easily. And they took a lot of shots down the field in week one. Carson Wentz's average throw was the highest in the NFL. Week two, after absorbing eight sacks, the emphasis was on getting the football out of his hands quickly. And so Carson did that, but there was no deep threat. And I would expect Adam to take a shot or two or three to Deshaun Jackson. He's still fast, still faster than everybody on the field. My question is, is that the defense? Are the Bengals going to give him an opportunity to make those kind of plays? Because I don't want Carson Wentz. And I think this is the whole problem. I think he's just forcing everything, certainly trying to make big plays. The fact that he's thrown four interceptions all on first down plays Mm. is so beguiling to me. And it indicates that he's trying to do too much. If the throw's not there, throw it away. Don't force it to J.J. ortega Whiteside in the end zone. That was such a killer interception. But, but again, look, if I'm, if I'm a defense, who, what's my priority? I'm trying to take away the tight ends. I'm trying to take away Deshaun Jackson. I'm letting J.J. ortega Whiteside in single coverage. I'm letting John, John Hightower and Greg Ward operate against single coverage. So you're going to go with Miles Sanders, tight ends, Deshaun Jackson. Some, you would hope one or two of those players uh, on a consistent basis is open. One argument I've made this week, um, or, you know, just kind of uh, in, in a little bit of defense, I guess, of Carson is without actually defending is to say his completion percentage, his passer rating is just overall acumen is the statistically so much lower than his career average that, you know, some type of progression to the mean, I think is expected over this week and going forward. You mentioned wanting to, to perform so badly. Um, you've been around Carson since he was a rookie. Where, what is it that you see about him that makes him just not – I don't want to you know, cast his first, but does he go out there and feel it? Try, does he try to carry the team too much? And why, why does he, is he like that, do you think? You know, Jeff, it's a great question because last year down the stretch, he had to carry the team. Mm-hmm. Greg Ward and with Boston Scott and with Josh Perkins, you know, with Rob Davis getting reps and Deontay Burnett getting reps. And he was really efficient. He didn't throw an interception in the last four games. He lost two fumbles. Seven, inter- uh, seven touchdown passes, uh, really um, worked in a very efficient, patient manner. For whatever reason, he seems to have lost that patience a little bit. And, you know, he's always had some Brett Favre in him. Um, and for better or for worse, he's kind of always been a gunslinger. So I think we're seeing something that is extremely unusual for Carson. And I agree with your regression or rather progression to the mean. I think that a guy who's thrown seven interceptions in the last, each of the last three seasons to have four already, that is alarming. And Carson really has to check himself and understand that he cannot do it himself. Look, it's five years in. Why are we still talking about this? Why is he holding the football too long? Why is he not having security uh, on a consistent basis in the pocket? These are questions Carson has to answer. I thought he turned the corner last year down the stretch. These first two games have indicated that there's still a little bit of that wild child 
at the quarterback position in Carson Wentz. Dave, when you covered Donovan McNabb and Andy Reid, when Donovan would go through his spells of inaccuracy, it, you know, Andy would talk about, okay, we just need to keep throwing, keep, keep throwing, keep throwing. This one's a little bit different when you talk. I, I, I think Carson, I, I think your point's very well taken. He's trying to do too much. It's, it's, you've been around Carson a lot. How do you think he handles not just criticism, but how does he get better? Is it just from coaching or is it, does he take responsibility? You have this unique situation where you work for the club, you've been around him, so you know him a little bit. Yeah. How do you think he yeah. takes all this stuff? Well, we talked about it yesterday, Carson and I, and I think hmm. he takes it very tough internally. I, he doesn't listen to you and me and yeah. Yeah. social media and all that stuff. He doesn't listen to that. I think he's really hard on himself. I think he takes coaching well. Uh, you know, these guys, they have to be hard on him um, because he's, he's, these have been costly, costly turnovers these first two weeks that you hope that you can win a few games here that you're not expected to win. Um, but I think internally he's taken it very hard. And, uh, but I think he also shrugs it off and comes back. By the, by the time literally Wednesday rolls around, what happened in the past, they've done all their film review, they've made all their mental corrections, and I think he has that re really great ability that the superstars have to shed all of that. Um, but again, in the heat of the game, you got to just make great decisions. You can't take chances. And we'll see, Adam. I mean, there is so much riding on Carson Wentz with a beat-up offensive line, uh, with a wide receiver core that doesn't have Alshon Jeffrey, doesn't now have Jalen Rager, hasn't seen the best of Deshaun Jackson. I think Carson has to go back to doing what he did late in the season last year. Chip away, chip away, chip away. Get the ball out of your hands. Run when it's there. Protect, secure the football. And even if it's ugly, just find a way to win games. I don't, I don't know if he comes out with another turnover-prone game on Sunday. Um, I, 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 this would be something that just would be shocking to me because I just feel like Carson will rise to the moment and have a big game against the Bengals. As I told him yesterday, uh, or rather on Thursday, I told him, um, Carson, I'm predicting four touchdown passes again. <laughs> um, and he laughed about it. So, uh, so at least there is still some lightheartedness here. He's not, he's not weighed down with the expectations. I think Carson puts more pressure on himself than anybody else can. Dave, there's been a lot of uh, talk this week about the 03 team that also started off 02 and had a lot of expectations. And, uh, you know, you, you were with that team just like you are now. Take us back to week three, Buffalo, and, and some of the <laughs> events that, that you remember from uh, that, that time period. Yeah, Jeff, it was divine intervention. The <laughs> we get on the charter plane, and we're heading to Buffalo on the Saturday before the Sunday kickoff. And all of a sudden, the air pressure drops, and the airplane went <sighs> – like really fast. I mean, people were shrieking. Like literally, it was scary. And everybody, we, and everybody obviously landed safely, went out and beat the Buffalo Bills, saved the season. Everybody thought, okay, this, there's some, some, some magic moment here. Something divine just happened here. So uh, then, of course, there was a loss and then maybe a win. And then I think the Giants and then Brian Westbrook's miracle of the Meadowlands in week five or six there. So um, it, it takes a little bit of luck sometimes. Um, maybe something will happen here in the next uh, little while before kickoff, and the Eagles will attribute that to uh, a good omen, if you will, and the Eagles will come out and win this game against Cincinnati. I do think that there is some sort of, um, in, you know, I believe this, that leadership, we, we all point to, hey, the Eagles have great leadership, all oh, this wonderful, fantastic. And when things are going well, you always have great leadership. Now things aren't going well. And, and so now we're really going to find out if this team has great leadership and if this team is listening to the coaching staff and if this team plays with a sense of urgency and a sense of purchase, uh, purpose, you cannot go out and lose to an 0-2 Cincinnati Bengals team. That is a very dangerous team. Excellent wide receivers running back with the two back-to-back 1,100-yard -back seasons. They believe in Joe Burrow. Uh, they are playing with house money. They're a dangerous team on Sunday. And so the Eagles have to play like the team that should win convincingly. We'll see if it happens. One thing I do want to bring up, Dave, with you is 2011. You were just talking about leadership. That, to me, in addition to some personal decisions that didn't work out well, the leadership on that football team in 2011, coming out of lockout, this is when they were spending a lot of money. The locker room wasn't great. It seems to me now, you tell me you're closer to the team than we are. 
is this a pretty good locker room in your opinion, based on the guys that you know, you've been around and what you're hearing? I hope so, Adam. I mean, I think that there've been some signs of like, you know, Hey, um, Zach Ertz and not being pleased with his contract, making that public. Um, that's testing. Okay. Um, all these injuries are testing, not having Malcolm Jenkins and everybody questioning that that is testing. So I think it's a good locker room. I mean, there certainly are a bunch of veterans who have been Eagles and have been together for many, many seasons who've been through this. And I can tell you that Brandon Graham in the last several days here has been one to rally the troops on the locker, uh, in the locker room and on the field, on the practice field. So we'll see if those words have any meaning. It really doesn't matter what I think. Uh, um, it matters how the Eagles go out and attack the Bengals with a sense of urgency because there have been some significant obstacles here early in the season. This is not something that just goes away, okay? The Eagles lost to a Washington team that they had absolutely no business losing to. And they had, a, they had a team in the Rams who gave them a clinic on both sides of the football. And had it not been for Cooper Cup's fumble, who knows how close the Eagles would have come. I mean, they, that was really a gift for the Eagles late in the first half of that game. So I can tell you, yeah, it's a great locker room. And, you know, Brandon Graham's a great leader and Jason Peters and, and Fletcher Cox and all these guys. But the proof is in what happens on Sunday. That's why we bring you in, Dave Spadaro, longtime Eagles insider from PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Dave. Real quick, you said you were talking with Carson. Is that, a vid is that going to be posted on the website, or was that just uh, uh, idle yeah, chatter? We, did a, uh, we do it on, um, for both a video piece, and we do it on my podcast, the Eagles Insider Podcast, which we have three times a week every Monday, or every Sunday night after the game, every Wednesday, and after, on Friday we do our tailgate edition. And Carson each week does an exclusive interview with me. So he's, we have a great relationship. He's very honest. I, I find him to be a great young man. Um, I, I do think he's got his head screwed on straight here. I don't think he's going to come out pressing. I do think the Eagles will be aggressive and really go after Cincinnati in this game. And, uh, and I do think the Eagles will win this game uh, in a, with a very strong showing. All right. There you have it from Dave Spadaro, longtime Eagles insider for PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Catch his work on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, and his insider column is a must-read. Remember, catch us, uh, Adam and I, and Greg Cosell and Trey Thomas on the Inside the Birds Live pregame show. Sunday starts at 10 a.m. at Goose Island Brew House. It's presented by DraftKings. We're going to have all the updates and all of the breakdowns. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll catch you on the next episode of ITB-TV.